Hey, good day, everybody. Welcome back to uh, the second half of chapter four of the eight chapters of the Rambam. Um, after yesterday's uh, session, it was such an honor and a joy to meet uh, uh, Rabbi Yitzhak Schwartz, uh, the creator of the Book of Job series that we ran through. Um, what a champion, you know, definitely a, 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 a visibly wise uh, a community rav, obviously somebody that uh, we all can look up for, up to. And I, I, I would love to see him do more series. Um, it would be an honor if he would be willing to, um, but we can just see the visible character there. But that's what uh, uh, we're still trying to grip and grasp here as part of the 70 nations of the world. Now, this book, The Eight Chapters of the Rambam, uh, subtitle, A Classic Work on the Fundamentals of Jewish Ethics and Character Development. And uh, hopefully you guys are getting a lot out of it. We're reading uh, uh, this this version with uh, the translation and commentary by Rabbi Yaakov Feldman. Um, I've done a few of his courses on uh, uh, off of Torah.org. Um, good morning, Sheila. I hope all's well with you. Now I'm going to try to continue uh, with where we left off there last Thursday with our reading. And uh, we're on the second half of chapter four, which has to do with treating diseases of the nephesh or the soul. Uh, remember, we got to keep in mind um, the previous chapter three, which had to do with diseases of the soul, uh, where uh, the Rambam described a lot. Um, we finished off on Thursday where uh, the Rambam talked about... Um, uh, leaving, uh, the corners of the field, the fallen grapes and the gleaning of the vineyard, as well as the rules of the sabbatical year and the Jubilee year, the offering enough and offering enough charity to meet the needs of the individual that comes, uh, 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 very, that comes very close to extravagance, but they are meant to draw us away from stinginess and towards extravagance. Remember Rambam's talking uh, when treating the diseases of the of the soul, uh, he's looking for that middle ideal uh, between two extremes. He's always uh, uh, taught to stay away from certain extremes. Patchy's design, welcome. In fact, if you were to reflect upon most of the mitzvot, uh, you would discover that they are meant to discipline our personal capacities in just such a way. So knowing that that's... Uh, uh, if you want the uh, the Coles Notes version uh, of what the mitzvot are designed for, uh, they're meant to discipline our personal capacities in just such a way to uh, uh, train our lives to be um, away from the extremes um, and more towards the middle. Um, let me read uh, Rabbi Feldman's notes. Nor gather the grapes of your vine. You shall eat the produce of your field in the jubilee year return every man to his possessions. And if you sell something to your neighbor or buy something from him, do not defraud one another. Buy from your neighbor according to the number of the years after the Jubilee, and he should sell the fruits to you according to the number of years uh, before a Jubilee year. Increase its price according to the number of years, despite the loss. And if the years are few, lower its price, for he is to sell you the fruits according to the number of the years. So they had a scale uh, that was uh, fair and just that surrounded uh, their jubilee year where, uh, um, you know, it, it avoided uh, uh, the massive uh, dilemma that most of the world finds himself in now, which is debt. Um if your brother becomes poor and has sold away some of his possessions and his kin comes to redeem it, he should be allowed to redeem what his brother sold. If your brother has become poor, then relieve him, though he may be a stranger or a sojourner, in order for him to live with you. Take no interest from him. Do not give him your money for interest, nor loan him uh, your food for profit. Now, this is... Uh, uh, for the Jewish people, of course, uh, the way they work with each other. And um, it's uh, the way Hashem has, has ordered them to function as far as an economy. Um, 
if your brother who dwells with you becomes poor and is sold to you as an indentured servant, do not compel him to serve as a slave. He should be like a hired servant and a sojourner to you. He should serve you up to the Jubilee year and then depart from you, both he and his children with him, and return to his family and to the possessions of his fathers. Now understand behind that, it's uh, like today, it's almost like uh, credit card companies try to get you you know, entangled and then put the screws to you for higher interest. Um, the reality is, uh, nobody wants to, uh, uh, be in debt. It's just the, the most horrible thing, but, uh, the Hebrew nation had been given, uh, economy, uh, from Hashem on how to operate. Uh, uh, but we, uh, in the 70 nations, boy, in my experience, the poor just come out of the woodwork when they know you're a giver. And they just, they, they will, you know, devour like locusts everything you have. So you have to be wise. They have to live under this uh, uh, to meet the needs of the individual. This refers to contributing to people who had once been self-sufficient and then became poor. And uh, doing so to the degree where they are able to live in a manner they had been used to before living before. Uh, he says, see, uh, Ketubot 67b, the trait of generosity. That is to say, the Torah enjoined us to not only offer charity once in a while, but to actually lessen and possibly compromise our own income and to purposely sacrifice some of our own needs for others in order to temper our innate selfishness and self-centeredness. And um, if you recall the words for, from Rabbi Schwartz yesterday, he really uh, encouraged us towards kindness to help build communities, uh, you know, get involved with uh, the poor and the sick in your area and uh, uh, do some actual uh, reaching out that, that uh, uh, does your community good. And uh, uh, I'm sure Hashem will give you a degree of influence wherever you are in just such a way. I, just a couple of paragraphs back, Rambam said that all the Torah asks of us is that we learn to avoid extremes. And yet here he says that it is it asks us to discipline our personal capacities, which isn't the same thing at all. Rambam says, uh, for example, the Torah forbade vengeance and avenging a murder with the declarations, do not take revenge or bear a grudge, Leviticus 19.18. Often you see a lot of people in poor scenarios or, or, or you can just tell they're bearing a grudge and they don't realize how it's uh, affected their own soul and uh, the lives of everything around them. But uh, uh, Hashem you know, told the Hebrew people, do not take revenge nor bear a grudge. If you see a donkey of someone who hates you, Lying beneath its burden, refrain yourself from leaving it to him. Rather, help him lift it, from Exodus 23, 5. Do not watch your brother's donkey or rocks fall down on the roadside and then hide from them. Rather, help him lift them up again, from Deuteronomy 22, 4. All in order to temper short-temperedness and anger. It is likewise written, do not watch your brother's ox or sheep go astray and hide yourself from them. Rather, return them to your brother, from... Uh, Deuteronomy uh, 22.1, in order to discourage stinginess and rise up before the aged and honor the old from Leviticus 19.32. It's like when Rabbi Schwartz showed up yesterday, I wanted to stand up. Uh, we're supposed to stand uh, uh, when a, a Torah scholar comes in the room, but it's pretty tough to do when you're on a virtual uh, meeting. So um, my camera would be showing my uh, my belt buckle if I stood up. All right, it's written, do not watch your brother's ox or sheep go astray. Hide yourself. Okay, in order to discourage stinginess and rise up before the aged and honor the old. Leviticus 19.32, honor your father and your mother, Exodus 20.12. And do not deviate from the sentence the judges will declare to you, Deuteronomy 17.11. And you need to look at that one as uh, in light of... You know, I find a lot of B'nai Noach do this, especially newbies. Uh, they rabbi shop, and they ask the same question over and over and over to different rabbis. That is kind of uh, prohibited, and that falls 
under this, do not deviate from the sentence the judges will declare to you. If you've asked for a rabbi's opinion, he's trying to give you the halakha position on, on, on the issue that you're asking. So you know clearly that this is the boundary line. Um, but if you disagree and you go ask someone else and you get a different opinion and you try to put them, pit them against each other, you're actually deviating from what they have uh, 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 poured their heart out to you and uh, you're showing them spite by doing it. Um, and that's from Deuteronomy 17, 11. In order to discourage the trait of audacity and encourage the trait of shame. However... It then steers us away from the other extreme, timidity. And it steers us away from timidity by saying, do not hate your brother in your heart, but surely reproach your neighbor when that is called for nonetheless. And do not bear a sin because of him from Leviticus 19.7. And do not favor anyone in judgment. Hear out the small as well as the great. Do not fear anyone for judgment is God's. And that's something we all can... Uh, uh, integrate know for sure that judgment is God's and that's from Deuteronomy 1 7 it it also discourages us from timidity and keep us on a balanced path so when some utter fool comes along in in quest of piety and wants to expand upon that by disallowing himself even more food and drink than usual by prohibiting marriage uh, by pro prohibiting himself to marry aside from the prescribed uh, restrictions and by hand handing over all his money to the poor or to the temple over and above the Torah's demands for the temple donations, charity and valuation, he is actually doing wrong. And without knowing it, he has gone to one of the other extremes and has utterly forsaken balance. So that's the, the Rambam's opinion on the matter, which, uh, you know, uh, a lot of us that came out of Christianity, uh, can attest that they stuff a ton of extremes and, and neglect that they're doing it. They just, their starry eyed uh, view of, of the world uh, doesn't uh, recognize when they go to extremes. In fact, our sages said the most wondrous thing I have ever seen about this very matter in the ninth chapter of Nadarim in the Jerusalem Talmud. They derived people who were, for all intents and purposes, imprisoning themselves with their self-imposed oaths to forbid themselves even more things than the Torah itself forbids. So, so you know, hear that clearly from the, Rab, the, the Rambam. He says it's a, a wondrous thing that he had, he had ever saw about this very matter in the ninth chapter of Nadarim in the Jerusalem Talmud. They derided people who were for all intents and purposes imprisoning themselves with their self-imposed oaths. And this is, um, you know, uh, for those of you that uh, sat through uh, Rabbi Uri Shirky's uh, Brit Shalom book, uh, you know, towards the end of the book, you know, he was very clear that uh, people should fulfill the oaths that they have, uh, they have pledged themselves to. In other words, be, be honorable with your words. And uh, uh, one concept uh, uh, I had, never heard one before becoming a Bene Noah was uh, uh, the, their Hebrew concept of Bli Neder. Uh, Bli Neder means uh, if I am able. In other words, you're saying, sure, I'd be glad to help if opportunity uh, presents itself, but it's without comp uh, commitment or obligation. Bli Neder, without obligation. So uh, just to understand that that concept existed, I found for uh, years, uh, being around certain people, they couldn't help but ask of us, uh, ask, uh, and, and it, it gets to the point where they will dictate your life, entire life, just steal your days, steal your resources, steal your, your time and your energy by asking. And sometimes the words of your own mouth become a self-imposed oath. And, um, you know, to be a person of character and integrity, if you say it, do it, okay? And that was Rabbi Uri Shirky's uh, uh, compelling in the end. If you say it, do it. So you have to learn to not say it. Uh, but I found the concept of Bli Netter, B-L-I, Netter, N-E-D-E-R. Uh, if you want to research that, Bli Netter, 
is a Hebrew concept of without um, guarantee. I've, I've been, found so many times in, in the past how many people said, you, but you said you would, you said you would, you said you would. I remember when I was young and I, I had bought a, a, a van and I was going to customize it, but as soon as I bought it, you know, hordes of people come out of the woodwork. Hey, can you help me move? You got a van. And it's like, you know, they just don't want to pay for a van. Uh, or rent one and um and they don't care about your resources they don't need care about your time uh they may pose as your friend um but be on guard against self-imposed oaths a lot of it brings you um uh pain and suffering uh your self-imposed oaths and uh This is something I still try to adjust uh, in my life, especially holding back those that were prone to asking. Um, all they would try to do is get a commitment out of my mouth uh, because they knew I'd live by my word. And I found, um, you know, it to be just just burdensome. Uh, but for the Rambam to point this out, when people imagine... Um, that uh, they actually forbid themselves even more things than the Torah itself forbids. You know, if you're praying to Hashem for blessing and, and wholeness and a lot of uh, uh, the problems in life come from prosperity or a lack thereof, if you're finding a lack of prosperity and you haven't been able to trim the fat off your life or trim the... Uh, you know, I've seen, you know, poor people that whittle themselves down to nothing um, left to trim. And uh, yet they, 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 they have not trimmed those, those, those people that push for a self-imposed oath. They're trying to get you to impose on yourself an oath. And, um, and in fact, they're trying to make you do more than what uh, the Torah uh, even commands of the Jewish folks. And uh, so the Jewish folks learn to steer away from that um, by saying, Rabbi Idi said in the name of Rabbi Yitzhak, has the Torah not already forbidden enough that you have to forbid yet other things? And uh, a lot of times people forbid themselves even prosperity. Um, and that's from the Jerusalem Tal Talmud Nadarim 9.1, as the Rambam had quoted. Okay, let me read uh, a couple of notes from Rabbi uh, uh, Feldman. He says, his point seems to be that the only way we'll ever train ourselves to keep away from extremes is by disciplining our personal capacities. For as he pointed out above in section one, it is our inner makeup that determines our actions and leads them either towards moderation or towards excess to temper short-temperedness and anger, since anger derives from and fuels the urge to take revenge, to discourage stinginess, since a stingy, self-serving person wouldn't be willing to spend the amount of time it would take to return someone else's stray sheep. Valuation, an amount of money based upon the contributor's own market value, that would, be, uh, that would vow to contribute to the Holy Temple. Okay, so let me go back on with the Rambam. And that is exactly what we have been referring to when it comes to being balanced rather than excessive or insufficient. Okay, so excessive and insufficient uh, is uh, the targets we're trying to stay away from. Uh, you, you, you don't want to uh, avoid being excessive to the point of being insufficient. You have to, you know, be proactive in life. Um, Hashem gave you free will for a reason and a purpose. And if you're using that, um, deliberately, uh, pointing somewhere, um, you, you, you'll, you'll, uh, treat your soul, um, the way it should be treated and, uh, you'll find prosperity. Uh, Shalom, Mike and Angela in the UK. Good to see you with us as always. Point 10 in chapter four. Thus, it is clear from what we have said in this chapter that it is proper to favor balanced actions and to only resort to an extreme in order to heal oneself or to counterbalance another opposite extreme. 
be like the medical expert who, if he saw in himself even a small symptom, he would not ignore it or allow the illness to take hold to the point where he would need the strongest medicines available. Or if he knew that one of his organs is weak, he would watch over it constantly and avoid things that would harm it and favor things that would either help treat or prevent it from getting weaker yet. It is likewise important for the the healthy individual to constantly scrutinize his character to weigh his actions, and to gauge his disposition every single day, and to quickly treat himself as soon as he notices himself inclining toward one extreme or another. Rather than allowing bad qualities to develop by repeating a wrongful deed again and again, as we explained, also one should be conscious of his personal flaws and always try to treat them. As we said earlier, since in In any case, everyone has his flaws. Accepting that we have flaws, you know, is the first battle to overcoming them, for sure. In this chapter, he says, see chapter 6 above, uh, the healthy individual. The original can also be worded as the whole individual. When he said healthy individual, it means a whole. W-H-O-L-E. Or perfect individual, so... However, we've chosen healthy here to maintain an analogy. Uh, Note, though, that the term healthy would refer here to one's moral or spiritual health. Well, in the instance just before, it is referred to one's physical health. Since everyone has his flaws, as Rabbi Feldman's notes, in short, we do well to develop a deep and all-inclusive self-awareness. Most of us simply don't strive for that, though. Largely because of the because the truth hurts. For indeed, the sort of introspection called for only proves how imperfect we are and how wrong and petty we can be. Yet we need to suffer the psychic ache and trauma of self-revelation if we're ever to reach our potential. Much the way a patient would have to suffer a physical ache and trauma of surgery to be well. Um, so we need to... Uh, uh, do that uh, self-assessment o- often. Uh, I love how he mentioned, Rambam mentioned even daily. Um, he does not trust his servants. That is to say that if God finds that he cannot trust his own heavenly servants and angels to be free of folly and personal error, how dare we assume that we are faultless? And that's usually a sign of the sickest soul, is somebody who imagines they are absolutely faultless. He says, does not sin. Also above, also see the statement in section four above, that no one is born with an inherently virtuous or flawed character. And the opening statement in chapter eight, which reads, it is not possible for man to be born either inherently lofty or inherently flawed just as it is impossible for him to be born instinctively adept at a trade. In chapter 6 below, we'll return to the difference between the views of the philosophers, i.e. Aristotle and his adherents, that while it is hard and hardly likely to find someone who by nature possesses all the virtuous intellectual and character traits, it's nonetheless not impossible. And Rambam's view that it is indeed impossible to find such a person, the difference will prove to be significant um, as we read on. And this has to do, you know, especially with the the Christians that believe in their perfect, uh, perfect, uh, what do they want to call them, uh, exact likeness. I mean, how how incorrect the notion can be. Um, Point 11 of the Rambam, uh, he says, nonetheless, As you know, God said to Moses, master of all earlier and latter prophets, because you did not believe in me enough to sanctify me in the eyes of the people of Israel, you will not bring this congregation into the land that I have given them from Numbers 2012. Aaron will will be gathered to his people. He will not enter into the land which I have given to the people of Israel because you, i.e. Moses and Aaron both, rebelled against my word at the waters of Meribah. 
from uh, Numbers chapter 20, 24. And because you sinned against me before the people of Israel at the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the Zin Desert, because you did not sanctify me in the midst of the people of Israel, you will not enter the land I am giving the people of Israel, from Deuteronomy 32, 51 and 52. But what was his sin? He inclined toward an extreme of particular personal virtue, composure, by expressing anger and saying, listen now, you rebels, must we fetch you water from this rock uh, from Numbers 20.10? And God objected to the fact that a man like him self would express anger towards the congregation of Israel when it was inappropriate. So understanding the depth of that sin that caused uh, Moses not to enter the promised land. Uh, so... Uh, Rabbi Feldman's notes, because you did not believe in me to sanctify me. This section seems to depart from the flow of the chapter. Rambam even relates to that digression at the end, saying, we have strayed from our actual intentions for this chapter, but actually the point of his section is to offer single, solitary exception to the statement made in the previous one, that everyone has his flaws, since Moses will prove to have become flawless despite appearances to the contrary. Expressing anger, that is to say, composure is the virtuous midway point between wrath and indifference. Moses expressed anger, which approaches but doesn't reach wrath. Okay. Hashem said it was inappropriate, but uh, for when someone of his caliber does something like this, it profanes God's name because the people studied every move Moshe, Moshe made and everything he said and learned from them and hoped to merit true bliss both in this world and the world to come by duplicating them. Uh, so how could he express anger, which is a bad thing to do, as we explained in a product of a bad disposition? But God remarks that Moses had rebelled against his words for in Numbers 20, 24 can only be explained thusly. Moses was not speaking to simple people or to people of low worth, but rather to a people whose most humble of women were on par with the prophet Ezekiel, the son of Buzi, as our sages pointed out. Um, you know, and chatting with Rabbi Goldberg, listening to uh, and asking questions about what it was really like in the desert uh, in the 40 years um, you know, coming out of Christianity, they teach that the whole generation perished as if they were all dying off because, uh, they were unbelieving. Um, but in reality, Rabbi Goldberg pulled out for me and showed, look, day in, day out, they ate the manna every day, day after day, after day, after day. It was, they saw miracle after miracle after miracle. Um, and so you were dealing with the caliber of person that, uh, trusted Hashem uh, to provide, and um, but God's remarks that Moses rebelled can only be explained thusly. Moses was not okay. Okay, so he says that those people that Moses were speaking to were on on a higher plane because they had been there and and experienced firsthand the miracles of Hashem. I don't know about you, but when I was a young man, when I was eighteen, I fell two hundred and forty feet down a cliff, and um, uh, was rescued, um, uh, by firefighters rappelling down and, um, long story short, I mean, if you ever experience something that kind of profound, it impacts your life in a way that, um, uh, is beyond, uh, average explanation. And, uh, this is where the idea of the miraculous, uh, affects us as human beings. I mean, we, we, we tend to, uh, uh, be motivated by such and, and encouraged forward. And this is why a lot of us uh, listen to Torah, where we're, we're, we want to hear the profound teachings of Hashem and have them turn on light bulbs and, and you know, convince us to continue the struggle um, against our uh, uh, Yetzir Hara uh, and be motivated to stand strong. But I love this character development stuff. They would examine everything Moses would say or do, and when they saw him grow angry, they said, he certainly has no personal 
flaws, if he did not know that God was angry at us from asking for water and that we already angered him, he, Moses, would not have expressed anger at us. In fact, though, God did not express anger or wrath when he spoke to Moses about this incident. He merely said, take this staff and gather the assembly together, both you and Aaron, your brother, and speak to the rock before their, their eyes. It will issue water and thus bring them water out of the rock and give the congregation and their animals something to drink from Numbers uh, 20, verse 8. When he said duplicating them, that is, they'd hope to learn from his example. As our sages pointed out, we are taught that the mere handmaid saw more at the splitting of the Red Sea than Ezekiel, the son of Buzi, the, the Kohen, and all the other prophets ever saw. So that, that was the question of the miracles again. Um, okay, he says, we have strayed from our intentions for this chapter, but we have thus solved a majority, the, a major difficulty in the Torah, which much has been said about in the context of which it has been often asked. What sin did he commit? Moses, anyway. Compare what we have said about this to what others have said and let the truth have its way. I will now return to my original point, point 12, Rambam says. If a person would weigh his actions all the time and strive for balance, he will become a person of the very highest caliber. He will thus draw close to Hashem and satisfy Hashem's wishes, for this is the most perfect form of divine service. As our sages of blessed memory explain this matter, whoever calculates his ways will merit to see the salvation of the Holy One. Blessed is he. As it is said, I will show God's salvation to him who sets. Vasam is the Hebrew word, the way right. From Psalms 50, verse 23. Rather than read Vasam, who, who, who sets, Read Vasham, who calculates, from Sota 5b. And Shuma refers to evaluation and appraisal. Uh, and this is exactly what we have explained in this chapter about everything being balanced. So we need to, uh, Rabbi uh, Poston has shared with me the concept that I've mentioned, uh, chesbon hanefesh, you know, accounting of your soul. It's something that we must get into the practice of doing. And the Rambam cites here expressly why this is necessary. Uh, if you want to merit to see the salvation of the Holy One, blessed is he. Um, he's quoting Psalm 50, verse 23. Psalm 5, verse 23. I will show Hashem's salvation to him who sets Sets the word sets the Sam his way aright rather than read the Sam who calculates. So, yeah, um, the very highest caliber. This is what Rabbi Feldman says. He says, Rambam's implication seems to be that such an individual would be a person of the very highest caliber, even if he doesn't achieve that balance, and that. It's the process as well as the humility and sensitivity involved that matters so. So did you hear that? It's, it's not a question of must achieve, but it's the process of doing the reflection that matters. I mean, Hashem knows your heart, and if your heart, Shalom, Barbara, good to see you. Um, if you're taking the time to do that accounting of your soul, regularly and even can, can work it into moment by moment in, in your actions. Um, uh, I found in my life, the th things that got me in a lot of trouble were always reactionary. And I find, um, the, the, the worst people for me are always the, the, the people that try to, you know, poke emotion. And we've read here about, uh, in the breakdown of the, of the soul and the senses and the way, uh, the senses tie into emotions. If you, you truly grasp how this factually works, you should be able to configure in your brain, you know, to avoid those that do nothing but poke at your emotions. And they're really just trying to get you to do a response without thought. 
And so uh, the rabbis always try to slow you down, get you to think about your actions and, and make your game plan and then implement it. And this is what Rosh Hashanah we've got to consider coming up. What did we do this past year from previous Rosh Hashanah? Did we achieve that which we uh, had set out to do a year ago? And, and, and did we make steps towards, have we grown? Uh, standing before Hashem, you know, you, you pray and ask for uh, favorable conditions for the following year. Um, but you also lay out the game plan and say, help me implement it. Uh, Hashem, uh, uh, obviously, um, Rambam's implication seems to be that such an individual would be a person of the very highest caliber, even if he doesn't achieve the balance and that it's the process as well as the humility and sensitivity involved that matters. So, and that's where relationship with Hashem comes in. You're praying, your prayers matter, developing that in your lifestyle. Um, you know, your prayers have to involve your game plan. Um, and your drive and desire. Hashem is trying to clarify that and help you understand exactly what you need uh, to see so that you can have a target to aim at. Um, uh, wandering in a desert uh, without, a, a, you know, a, a, a focal point, you can, you know, you'll perish just not knowing where to go. Um but if you have a game plan and a destiny, you pick the destination and you start working towards it, uh, you're going to make progress. Evaluation and appraisal. That is the verse, I will show God's salvation to him who sets his way aright can legitimately be read. I will show God's salvation to him who calculates his way and thus sets it all right. So um, integrating that into your daily walk and into your life will change your life completely. And, um, you become a person of purpose, a person of, of focus, a person of integrity. Uh, but, but if you don't pay attention to it, um, uh, there, the, the elements of this world will just keep bombarding your soul. And there's nothing worse than feeling like your life is out of your own hands and you're just swept down a river uh, by the uh, raging waters and you can't prevent the flow or direction. Um, we're not built for that as human beings. I mean, we need to have, uh, a degree of fulfillment. Um, and, uh, in order to do that, you've got to actually have, um, a plan and a purpose. And, um, when you can unify those with Hashem's desire for your life, it all comes together, but you can't go wrong with character development, but understand, uh, if your soul is de diseased and there are elements just crushing and affecting you. I mean, I, I found working for certain, like when I left the auto industry, it's just, I couldn't do what they wanted anymore. There's just the people I was working with just wanted to function with too much guile, um, too much deception. And I could not, uh, clean of conscience, be part of that. And, uh, um, you know, when their focus is only on the bottom line and all they're doing is chasing, uh, uh, vanity, um, rather than, uh, chasing, uh, the benefits of good business ethics, it, uh, it, it was a turnoff for me. And, uh, I'm just overjoyed to be sharing, uh, even, even this. Okay. This concludes what we deem should be said about treating the diseases of the nefesh. But I've got uh, two and a half pages of the synopsis of, of chapter four. So um, synopsis. One, God de good deeds lie midway between two extremes. Virtuous qualities lie midway between two extreme qualities. And specific qualities tend to foster specific deeds. This is what we need to take away from this chapter. Specific qualities tend to foster specific deeds. For example, temperance is a balanced trait and is a product of a virtuous quality and is good. Indulgence and asceticism, the two polar opposite extremes of temperance, are bad. The same goes for other balanced 
versus extreme traits like generosity, as opposed to stinginess and extravagance. Courage, as opposed to daring and cowardice. Happiness, as opposed to brashness and dullness. Humility, as opposed to arrogance and self-abasement. Earnestness, as opposed to boastfulness and meekness. Contentment, as opposed to indulgence and sloth. Composure, as opposed to short-temperedness and apathy. Shamefacedness, as opposed to audacity and bashfulness and the like. So hopefully you guys get that point of the balance between extremes. Point three, uh, people often mistakenly consider character extremes to be good. They might consider daring people to be brave, indifferent people to be tolerant, lazy people to be content, and lethargic people to be temperate. And they might admire extravagant and boastful people, but that is wrong because we're to strive for balance in our behavior. Nevertheless, it is important to understand that virtues and flaws only affix themselves onto us when we repeat the behavior patterns associated with them again and again. So hopefully you guys get that, okay? Nonetheless, it's important to understand that virtues and flaws only affix themselves to us when we repeat the behavior pattern associated again and again and again. And it's that same old adage that... uh, you know, uh, a repeated behavior becomes a, a practice and that becomes a lifestyle. And um, we need to see how to work our ways out of that. You bend yourself back um, to the opposite extreme if you have a, a flaw, but you go to the exact opposite extreme for a period and then balance it off. All right. You need to have an understanding of the other side. And it's very, very hard for somebody who's used to being super shy to learn to be outspoken a bit more, to balance it out, to be a healthy uh, whole person, a whole soul. You know, as I mentioned and played the other day, that uh, comment by Rabbi Baruch Gardner, I recommend his book, Living a Line to Anybody, because it really starts to put into place a lot of what the Rambam talks about. Four, since no one is born with an inherently and utterly virtuous or flawed character, it is important to tend to your character much the way you would tend to your body when it goes off kilter. For when the body is indeed off kilter, we reverse its course until it returns to a state of equilibrium where we then allow it to stay. We should do that when it comes to our character as well. So if one is self-abnegating, for example, he would be encouraged to be profligate until he has expunged the trait of self-abnegation, at which point he would be encouraged to um, allow himself some amenities. While if one is profligate, he would be encouraged to be somewhat self-abnegating, but he would not be encouraged to go to the other extreme of profligacy quite as much in the process as he would be if he had been self-abnegating. Some of these terms are are not common to us in this day and age. You can look it up. All right, point number five. As such, since it is easier to go from uh, profligacy to merely allowing oneself some amenities than it is to go from utter self-denial to profligacy, just as it is easier to go from asceticism to temperance than it is to go from indulgence to temperance. We would thus have an indulgent person behave ascetically longer than we would have an ascetic be indulgent in the process of rectifying their personalities. We would have a cowardly person act daringly longer than we would have a daring person act cowardly. And we would have a meek person be boastful longer then we would have a boastful person act meekly. And I've met some people that, you know, they, 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 so, uh, they so hold highly uh, meekness that they, they actually need to learn to be boastful a little bit for a period to understand a balance um, because uh, their meekness is actually an extreme and um, 
The pious, however, wouldn't settle for equal balance. They would tend toward one extreme or another, depending on circumstances, in order to safeguard themselves against sin. They would be somewhat more ascetic than temperate, somewhat more daring than courageous, somewhat more earnest than boastful, somewhat more humble than meek. Some pious individuals even fasted, awoke in the middle of the night and prayed and studied, avoided meat and wine and the like, but only for the sake of their moral well-being when those around them were corrupt, in which case they feared being adversely affected. Now, when fools who knew nothing of why the pious were doing what they did saw the individuals acting that way, they set out to do the same, assuming that this was how a person would draw close to God. But rather than doing good, they were actually doing harm. Keep that in mind. That we learned in this chapter as well. Point eight. The Torah means for us to live a normal life, to eat, drink, and have relations as permitted in moderation to live in society, and to wear standard clothing. It frowns upon extremes and encourages us to achieve intellectual and personal virtues. And this is why, especially with B'nai Noach, that uh, want to start wearing uh, kippahs and talits. I mean, they're, they're going to an extreme to familiarize or be viewed familiar with the, the Jewish people, and they actually can be a bad witness and so uh, we try to steer them away, but some of them just don't get it. They think they need that. It's like a baby with a, a baby blanket they can't let go. It's sad, but it happens. Hence, if one is foolish enough to believe that he should deny himself all pleasure in order to discipline himself, he is wrong. For what the Torah meant for us to do was to systematically withdraw from indulgence in order to implant the traits of temperance generosity and shamefacedness, as well as to discourage anger and bashfulness. Therefore, one should always favor balanced actions over extreme ones other than to heal himself. One should be introspective and self-aware. One should be like someone who senses he is becoming ill and remains constantly alert to his condition, making sure it isn't deteriorating who avoids anything that would do harm, do him harm, and favors things that would make him well, which is to say one should try to rectify his flaws, for none of us are without them. Profound. Point 11. In fact, even Moses wasn't without his flaws. He became angry at one point and referred to the Jewish nation as rebels when, his, when, was in a, when this was inappropriate. He thus profaned Hashem's name and set a bad example for the rest of the nation since they watched his every move and listened to his every, everything he said in order to learn from him. And he caused them to draw false, a false conclusion about Hashem's intention. Therefore, one should always, point 12, always judge his own actions and strive for balance in them. And then he will be a person of high caliber and he will draw close to Hashem and satisfy his wishes and thus serve him in the best of ways. So that is the end of chapter four, folks. Um, now, we're going to get into chapter five tomorrow. This has to do with um, using all of one's personal capacities to one end and um, uh, where I find the Rambam has spoke about the diseases of the soul and then how to treat it. He's now giving a, he starts to shift to give us direction on how to focus and become more positive, uh, um, moving towards uh, a, a healthier life. So where the book has, has, has taken us thus far, is to understand the understand the, the, the bits of the soul, uh, when it is ill, understanding how to correct it. Now he's going to give us actual direction to, to, to correct it. And this has to do with uh, using your capacity to one's end. Um, and this is why I um, am committed with the Noahide World Center to do all I can to try to help them uh, achieve uh, their potential. And I think they've got great potential. It's just such a joy when I see them 
reaching out all around the planet. And um, Rabbi Goldberg's trip back to, um, he should be arriving in Jerusalem today. Um, uh, his trip, yeah, he told me it was going to be 48 hours, and I know he left on Sunday, so he'd be arriving probably Tel Aviv and then making his uh, drive back to to Jerusalem and I've been praying his journeys were safe and well and uh, that's just a long time tripping around the planet uh, it's hard on every person uh, but uh, Hashem willing he's met some favorable uh, conversations along the way he's such a jovial kind character that uh, um, I'm sure he uh, tries to shine the light of Torah wherever he is and um, I know he'll be back there in Jerusalem today. And it, I'm just so thankful they let us share on their, their station. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, we're also trying to uh, develop more uh, material for the International Noahide Network to be on our Roku station, which I am constantly uploading new material. But uh, like I said in its introduction, uh, it may, for the first little while, look like it's just a mirrored image of the Noahide World Center YouTube station. Um, but there's so many profound and great lessons we've uh, been involved in over the last number of years that uh, I think the world needs to, um, you know, hear. Um, are you folks enjoying this eight chapters of the Rambam? You guys are fairly quiet out there today. Well, everybody's quiet, so I'm not, you know, maybe we'll have to shut her down early today. I don't want to jump into chapter five. I think I'm looking at the length of the chapter. Um, I got 11 good pages, and, uh, yeah, if I started breaking into it, I would only get part way, and that wouldn't, uh, I don't think, I think I try to keep it balanced. Uh, I think there's a whole session tomorrow in chapter five. But then I find chapter six, as I mentioned, right from the beginning of the of the uh, uh, introduction, chapter six, the Rambam talks about. He says the difference between the eminent person and one who controls his desires, and uh, this is such a profound chapter um, because this is where Torah actually holds that somebody who controls their desires is. Um, somebody who's more elevated than somebody who is just an eminent person. And if you don't understand uh, the concept, an eminent person is just somebody who does not have uh, the inklings to sin. Whereas uh, one who controls his desires, these are people that uh, um, are afflicted. Their e evil inclination just is a tough thing for them. And it's always popping up its ugly head. Um, and they have to fight it at, at all times. So um, the Rambam, you know, he, as we'll see, he cites a lot of uh, King David as, a, as an example of somebody who had to control, understanding the ability uh, and potential that King David had and um, the, 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 the challenge that comes with it, uh, its interaction from Hashem, if you see it for what it truly is. I really think... Uh, Rabbi Schwartz uh, kindly uh, and profoundly pulled out some wonderful words yesterday. I recommend everybody check that out. Uh, yesterday's uh, session, uh, I, I titled it as the ending of uh, the book of Job because it was just a joy to meet uh, Rabbi Schwartz and, and hear a, a profound uh, scholar. I mean, somebody who's a community, uh, a rav, uh, so he's, you know, not just the Rosh HaYeshiva, the dean of his, his, his university, community built around it. And, um, uh, you know, he's obviously vis visible, a person of high quality and character. And uh, there's eight chapters of the Rambam, I hope you guys realize, is just a, uh, an opportunity to understand how the Rambam encouraged and, and, and uh, tried to develop 
uh, and give the tools to help everybody become people of high moral character. Um, but always, uh, I think the encouraging thing is to, to, to do an accounting of your soul at all times. If you're ever faced with a, con- a, a dilemma, do not let people pressure uh, you for a decision. Like I've said before during the book of Job, uh, uh, indecision, hesitation, uh, and confusion are all the dwelling place of, of demons, the uh, malachim. Um, uh, if you're indecisive, stop. Just don't don't go any further with a decision until you've researched. Um, hesitation, um, you know, there's reservations. Study why you're hesitant. Know why you're hesitant, and let your action be deliberated. You where you actually have have weighed the whole of the matter before you make a decision. You'll be more a more um, identified person, a more whole person who's 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 intent. You know, uh, you know they look in courts uh, when a criminal does an action. Uh, they look for that mensa ray that that. Uh, mental commitment, uh, where there was intent, um, of a, of a crime, but, uh, true righteous people, um, have intent to be righteous, uh, where their actions are functioning, um, uh, with intent to be righteous and, uh, study, uh, and learn from your rabbis and learn from uh, the Torah and the material, that is available to you, but um, do it with intent for purpose. And this is what I think tomorrow's chapter will really help us because it, it'll it'll talk about using all of one's personal capacities to one end. But I think the Rambam here allows us, and he shows us uh, in this chapter where you can uh, choose what that end is. And I found that very profound, especially when I did that course with Rabbi Goldberg on freedom to choose your 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 destiny. Um, and how to implement it. I find the Rambam gives the tools to actually begin to implement where, uh, um, so I encourage if you're a little confused on your purpose for existence, join us for tomorrow's class. It might help give some clarification on where you can decide um, what the joys of your heart will be and begin to formulate um, the steps necessary to get there. You know, um, Hashem wants you fulfilled, and He wants your 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 life uh, to have depth and meaning. Um, that's what living is all about. Um, truly, um, you know, I find death to be the opposite, where meaningless and futility, and uh, uh, you know. But I think um, tomorrow's chapter using all of one's capacity to one end. I think the Rambam gives us the parameters where you can actually have a say in that. Forgive me, I'm going to sneeze. And there's nothing more exciting than uh, somebody's life's drives or ambitions or desires being full or fulfilled. And, uh, the joy in the relationship with Hashem, when you realize that he's given that to you and you make that decision, you consciously take steps towards it and he opens the door or closes the door or refines your character in the process. Um, you realize your, your life is no longer just, uh, uh aimless. Okay. And so tomorrow's lesson will be very, very critical. Hopefully you'll join me. I know as uh, about a ha- uh, 30 minutes sh- shorter than usual, uh, so but I'm going to shut it down for today, and I wish you all well. Johnny Riggs says, yeah, very much he's enjoying uh, uh, where to get the book. This is the one, I, the cover I've put here, uh, uh, Rabbi Yaakov Feldman, The Eight Chapters of the Rambam. You can find it on, uh, uh, you know what, let me see if I can find you a link. Yeah, here, I'm going to give you the Amazon link. I bought this um, book probably 15 years or so ago, 
dozen or more years ago. Here, Johnny Riggs, here's the, here's a link to the book. Okay. That's on Amazon. Um, two used from 76 bucks, three new from 85. Boy, oh boy. Some of these Torah books, they keep going up in price. Um, but I've had this one for, uh, like I say, I think uh, 12 or 15 years. And uh, this is probably my fifth reading. And I, I never keep it far from me because I know that there's material in there that is um, critical for life and for me encouraging. But it's the tools. It's almost like, uh, I don't know about you. I do a lot of tutorials with Adobe and um, uh a lot of video making software and uh, you do these tutorials just to stay familiar with the how to get to the end result to make something look a certain way. Um, but it's like anybody who uh, learns anything, uh, maybe electronics or uh, some kind of uh, even building a house. I mean, there's, there's certain ways to do it and certain ways not. If you're always learning, um, I find, you know, this book teaches us how to learn. Uh, when you understand uh, a diseased soul is one that can't learn and how a whole soul is not just, uh, doesn't just know how to learn, it knows how to implement uh, what it's learned. And this is really where the definition of wisdom uh, and of knowledge and uh, wisdom uh, come into play. You may know how to do something, uh, but wisdom knows when, how to put it into play. And um, um, I find that this book is one of those books that takes and, and gives the knowledge that can uh, uh, stretch into wisdom. And um, uh, I think the Rambam success here is that he, per, he, he tries to teach us to pursue piety in a balanced life. And, um, you know, um, I'm going through that 48 ways to wisdom with Rabbi Post. And I know it's a profound course when I first did it myself uh, with the notes. It might even been with Rabbi Feldman's material. I can't recall, but they were just they so deep. Um, you know, it talks about being crowned with uh, uh, Torah and um, just, just acquiring uh, wisdom. Um, I think uh, this book, the eight chapters of the Rambam, gives us the tools to 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 be able. Uh, to me, I've you know I thank the rabbis for teaching me how to learn um, a lot of things in this world. If you're if you're if you're given to these extremes that the rabbis Rambam's warning against, um, you're not going to know how to learn because the extremes are going to move you around like a pinball in life and your emotions are going to be uh, poked at. You can't control what comes your way, only how you deal with it. And um, is your, is your, 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 your goal, your, your one's end that you're going to select for yourself, that life fulfilling um, uh, purpose uh, plan for you is, uh, are you going to, you know, keep the perseverance to keep going for it, even in the, in the face of certain adversity and work your way through things. Um, life can be best lived. So, um, you know what, I best, you know, stop rambling and, uh, glad you got it. Uh, uh John Riggs, wonderful book, but, um, like I, I've, I put out there before there is a, uh, 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 a free uh, digital version on uh, on Safari uh, you can uh, get, but you won't get Rabbi Feldman's notes, which sometimes are very helpful in explanation uh, to clarify even uh, the great Rambam uh, who made it very uh, digestible. Um, having another rabbi rework it, it's just like perfect sanding on, on edges of a, a fine piece of furniture. Um, yeah, Rabbi Feldman has done a great work with this book, and it's become dear to me. And so I hopefully you folks can see the wisdom uh, in it. And please join me again tomorrow. We're going to talk about Chapter 5 tomorrow, using all of one's personal capacities to one's end. And I'm positive it'll have a, um, a message for you in how you can uh, uh, begin to... Uh, uh, take charge of your, your life and then integrate the character traits necessary to get where you want to go to be truly fulfilled. So, 
Uh, thanks for joining me uh, today for the second half of chapter four. And hopefully we'll see you all tomorrow, same time, uh, Hashem willing. So have a wonderful, wonderful day, folks.